gave you a new one. Tune in and uh, share a comment down below. And uh, maybe join us next time at 1064 Penn Avenue in Wyoming, Pennsylvania. Again, welcome. Several announcements for the good of the body gathered here today. Later after worship will be our Advent workshop. We will gather downstairs for a meal. And then um, there will be crafts for decorating the um, tree that we're going to be decorating later today. We're also going to be um, putting up the creche and finishing decorating the sanctuary for Christmas. If you want to be a part of that, please stay. We'd love to have you and do that. Um, and I think there is enough food for several more people to come. So if you haven't signed up yet, please don't let that get in the way. I want to say too that um, December 7th, the consistory meeting will take place and um, to approve a budget for 2022. And uh, then it will be sent out to you uh, uh, by mail and so each person will get it and you'll have a good week to um, look at it there'll be the congregational meeting on December 19th we also will be electing new officers so be looking for the names of the people listed in that letter as well next week the Keystone Brass comes here and um, please invite a friend if you've never heard them they're really a joy and uh, will add a lot to the service and um, with their musical talents and then on the 19th, we, the uh, Christmas Youth Play makes a return, and um, they're working on that, and it's a very exciting um, concept. They're so cute and meaningful at the same time, so you're definitely going to want to invite people to that as well. Um, at this point, uh, Lori, if you'd like to come forward. Good morning. Um, I have two quick announcements. One is a reminder that um, a week from Monday, the 13th, is the women's dinner. Um, we're still taking reservations if you're interested. Um, if you don't have money with you, that's fine. You can pay the night of the event. Um, the cost for dinner is $12, and we ask that you bring a donation for Keystone military families of either toiletries, underwear, socks, um, can be for both men or women, doesn't matter. Um, whatever you are able to get would be great. Um, secondly, um, look for an order form in the Bowsman e-blast to go out this week for poinsettias. Um, we'll also have hard copies here next Sunday. Unfortunately, due to time constraints with the florist, we need to have your orders back by the 19th of December, which is the following Sunday. So if you're interested in placing a poinsettia here for Christmas Eve and for um, the 26th, um, you can put one in in memory or in honor of an individual, or if you just want to purchase some for your own use, um, please look for those forms and complete them and get them back by the 19th. Thank you. Thank you too, Lord. Yes, Kathy. Good morning. Sue and I have been checking the gifts this morning, and there are two that were taken, but someone did not sign his or her name. So if you took a, took a tag and didn't sign in, please let us know. And if your gift is not here yet, please let us know that you'll have it here by Tuesday when they will be, will be delivered to Salvation Army. So thank you very much. Thank you too, Kat. Mm -hmm. Is there any other announcements? Seeing that there isn't, let us all share, rise and share the peace and love of Christ with one another in our morning welcome.
We gather around the Advent wreath today, knowing that we are not perfect, that we all make mistakes and do bad things. Only Jesus obeyed God fully. <coughs> Jesus helps us to live as God wants us to live. Je Jesus gives us peace. The scripture reading um, is from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onwards and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. We light this candle to proclaim the coming of the light of God into the world. With the coming of this light, there is peace, for Christ is called the Prince of Peace. Christ's name is also Emmanuel, God with us. The presence of Christ with us gives us peace day by day. Eternal God, we thank you that through all the years, you have given peace to our people. Help us to have peace in our lives. We pray that in this Advent season, we may, by all we do, show your presence to the sick, to the hungry, and to the lonely, so that they too may have peace. Amen. Let us pray. Source of salvation, 
what shall we do? Our lives are unworthy of the goodness you offer. We complain of our condition when our wants go unnoticed. Contentment eludes us, since when we have plenty, we still yearn for more. Millions face hunger while we fret over abundance. Through Christ, forgive us, yet grant us no peace until we share our bread with the hungry and our homes with those who lack shelter. Jesus tells us, like the good shepherd, he chases after us when we wander off the path. Believe the good news of the gospel, that in Jesus we are forgiven, in Jesus we are sought out, in Jesus we are brought back to the path and given the choice to live for him and God and others as well as ourselves. Believe this good news, rejoice in this good news, and give thanks to God for this good news. You may be seated. Let the young Christians come forward. I'm not going to do that again, right? 
and then I'm going to try and clean up the mess that I made, right? And that's the way that it is when, when we make mistakes. And when we do that, we're being, very, we're being very grown up. And when we do that, I think it brings a smile to God in Jesus' face. And I don't know, but I hope it brought a smile to my Father's face that I, that I admitted my mistake and I cleaned it up. Well, God bless you, and thank you for coming up here and sharing. And it's great to see you all, and God bless you. Go back to your pews, or if you're allowed, you can go to the nursery. This time I invite you to turn to the bulletin to our prayer of illumination and let us join our voices and faith in prayer. Let us pray. We give you all praise, O God of salvation. We come with devotion to you, O Christ our Redeemer. We honor you, O Holy Spirit, our source of encouragement, one God who sustains us with your love and your presence. Help us to hear your words of life and health as we bow down before you. Grace us with your presence that we may learn of your way. In the holy name of Jesus we pray. Amen. The scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, verses 1 through 14. In the 15th year of the reign of Empress Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip, ruler of the region Ituria and Trachonitis, and Licinius, ruler of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, Make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds ask him, What then should we do? In reply he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what should we do? He said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages. Thus ends the lesson. Mary Poppins, Mary Poppins sings that song, A spoonful of, me of sugar helps the medicine go down. Do you think that's true? Do you, do you like it? No. <laughs> She'd just rather have that yucky medicine than that candy-coated medicine. 
Um, however, I like that the I like the medicine to be candy coated, and the medicine I'm and the medicine I'm talking about now is not for your body, but for your soul, for your spirit, for your mind, for your personality, for your humanity. Are there times when maybe we, whether we admit it or not, need to hear some medicine in word? And uh, do we rather have them be sugar-coated, or do we just want the plain, unvarnished gospel truth? In the four gospels, in the four gospels, um, John the Baptist is in each one of them in different ways, but he's there before the coming of Jesus all the time. Uh, it's their way of saying that what John the Baptist said, his mission, his ministry matters. And at some level we need to hear what John has to say before we can really embrace and be open and properly receive into our lives Christ. The lectionary for each year has on the, this Sunday a visit from John the Baptist because the church has said that we need to hear this message from John, if we are going to help ensure that we are open to receiving the risen Christ into our lives individually and collectively as a church. As I listen to Luke, and listen to Luke these past few weeks, it seems to me that he has both of them in there. He has the sugar-coated version, and then he has the plain, unvarnished gospel truth. He says that John was in the wilderness, and he gets this call to mission and ministry from God, and he begins this message of repentance and connected that was a baptism of trying to wash your body uh, as a sign that you are going to wash up your life, your thoughts and your words and your deeds as best you are able. And he, in this point then, he quotes Isaiah the prophet and the poet. And in these beautiful words, right, makes the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the path for the coming of the Lord. Fill in the valleys and lower the mountains and hills and make straight those roads that are crooked and make smooth those places that are rough so that all of salvation, all of flesh, all people shall see God's salvation coming and receive it. That's beautiful words, right? I kind of wish I wrote those things. But as I listen to those words, that's kind of sugar-coated because it seems to me there's lots of room for interpretation of what it means to fill in those valleys in our lives. For me to fill in the valley of my, of my life, a low spot in my life, and the way you fill a valley in your life might be totally different from one another, and we might be different understandings of what it means to lower those mountains and hills and smooth out those rough spots. That there's wiggle room in there. That doesn't sound all that hard. That doesn't sound all that demanding, right? I mean, we'll give it the good old college try. There's room there for negotiation. It's not very clear. Expectations. Last week, in one of the three points that I made, is about one of the three points of Christ's coming, of this belief that Christ finally comes at the end of our lives or at the end of time, is that, is that um, are we ready to receive him? Have we come to accept what he offers, God offers us in Jesus for forgiveness of sin and a place in his family? And are we trying to follow the teachings of Jesus, the commandments of Jesus? So that's, that's part of it, but does that really exhaust this meaning of what it means to lower these fill in these valleys and lower these mountains and smooth those rough places? It seems to me that we can interpret the teachings of Jesus differently as well. <clears throat> do you really hear what God is calling us in John the Baptist to do? through this sugar-coated quote of Luke from Isaiah? Or do you and I need the plain and varnished gospel truth? Because Luke gives it to us. Did you notice the next part after that? He says all these people were coming out into the wilderness to hear John speak and to be baptized. And he says, you brood of vipers, you snakes, who warned you to come and flee the wrath of God? What would happen if I would have welcomed you this morning like that? But I didn't do it that way, did I? I said, oh, it's good to see you. 
Welcome. Welcome visitors, welcome. It's nice to have you today. You brood of vipers. And don't think that you can have Abraham as your father. Don't think just because you've been a member of this church your whole life long or for three generations that that means anything. Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do words and deeds that really show that you are changed and going to be different. Don't go through the motions. Don't rely on your membership card. Even now the axe is laid. Even now judgment is just around the corner. Are you ready? Are you ready? Does anybody need to hear a message like that? I guess what I did with, with, the, uh, with the kids, with the kids, you know, that was either a 69 Camaro or Barracuda. <laughs> and he told me no. He said, Mark, Andy, and Andy Rosa went on to become president of Kaplan. If you ever heard of Kaplan, it's a multi-billion dollar uh, thing. So there we were, soaping up his car. He told us, don't do it. Don't do it. But we didn't heed that warning. He said, you better not. But then after the fact, with my father, I definitely heard the message, don't do that again. <laughs> Are there sometimes that we need to hear the plain and varnished gospel truth? When you hear that word repentance, what does it mean? What does that word repentance mean? We hear it every now and then, but what does it mean? It means three things. Number one, it means what? I'm sorry. But you know, I'm sorry is not the most important thing of the three. It matters. It's, it's good if you're sorry, but if you're not sorry, you know, did you ever do things you're really not sorry about? I gotta say, I really wasn't sorry about soaping up that car. I was sorry I got caught. <laughs> but ideally, you're sorry for what you've done. But if not, it's more important that you what that you commit that I'm not going to do this again because it's wrong. And that's is that enough to commit that you're not going to do it again? Let's use an example. Suppose I stole five thousand dollars from you, right? And you trace it down to me, and you saw that I stole $5,000 from you. And you come to me, and I go, did you steal $5,000 from me, Pastor Mark? And I go, yes, I did. And I go, I'll never do it again. Okay? And leave it at that. Would you be happy? No. You want that money back, right? Anybody not want that money back? <laughs> Let me know. We'll put that to the test. We'll put that to the test. But the point is, you want that money back, you want restitution. In fact, the biblical understanding of restitution is not only you pay back what you owe, you pay back a percentage on top of that. You make it even better, you try to make it even better to show you're really sorry and you've learned your lesson. And that's what repentance is about. And that's what we're called here with John the Baptist, either sugar-coated, quoting Isaiah, or black and white, you brood of vipers, you better bear fruit worthy of repentance, the plain and varnished gospel truth. <clears throat> That we really take to take this seriously. Not relying on God's grace so much that we get wishy-washy in our faith and we live with things and attitudes and behaviors that we really shouldn't. That we really shouldn't. Does anybody need to hear a word from John the Baptist today? But he doesn't end there, does he? He goes on to say, you know, he's been so effective in his preaching that people are raising their hand. What do I do? What should we do? Even tax collectors are coming and saying, what should we do? And you know what he says to them? Do not collect more than what you're supposed to collect. I don't know if you know this, the history of, back of tax collectors, but they would bid with the Roman Empire on a region like the city of Reading or Wide Missing. And then they would pay a certain amount to the government of the Rome, and then they would try and collect that and more and make a profit. There was a certain amount, which I don't really know what it was, which was a reasonable profit, what, 20, 30 percent above what you pay to get the area. But there were those that were tempted to gouge and gouge and get every penny, every shekel that they could. 
and they were obscene in their efforts, and they really mistreated the people to get every last shekel. And it's interesting, John says, just do what your the proper amount is. Notice he doesn't say you should quit being a tax collector. See, I would have thought that. Don't be a tax collector because you were thought of as a traitor working for the Romans. He just says, don't be a bad businessman or woman or whatever the case might be. Don't abuse your position. Before I went to a seminary, I worked in a management position in retail. And uh, I was an assistant manager. I was working as front half of a store, overseeing people, working with people under the leadership of the manager. And as I progressed through the management program, I learned in the back office there that they were doing some shenanigans to help increase the bottom line. They were writing what's called, called false claims. False claims are where you write to a company or a vendor that something is broken or damaged and you want credit for it. And hopefully they will not ask for the goods back and you will just add that, the cost of whatever it was to your bottom line and profit. For example, if you had a tent in, in, in sporting goods that was torn and it cost the, the, cost the company $80 and you sold it for $120, if you said one of the four that we got were damaged, and they gave you credit for it, you got $80 worth of credit, $80 worth of profit. And, and if they asked for the damaged goods, then you just tore it and sent one in. As a way to increase the bottom line, and I was expected to go along with this. And when I questioned this to the associate manager, I said, you know, this doesn't seem right, this doesn't seem good. That did not go over well with him. That did not go over well with the manager the next day. They said, you know, you think you're not gonna do this, Mark? You're not going to play this game? Do you, this, this is how they tried to sell it to me. They said, do you know that they know we're going to do this? So they bump up their price enough to cover those costs. So if we don't do this ourselves, we're losing out on stuff that they're charging us for. Does that make sense? Business people, we're still to be Christians in our business, in our business circles for those of us who are working in business. It's not just me and Jesus. Our, John, our Luke tells us in Jesus, the good news of Jesus is that it has implications across our lives. Not just our own individual morals and ethics. Another group, the whole group, the crowds come, and the crowds come and they say, what must we do? And did you catch what Jesus said? He said, if you have two coats, you must share with one who has none. If you have more food than you need, you must share with those who have none. He doesn't say, he didn't say, if you have more than you need and it's a good idea to share, please do. He said, you must share with those who have none. This is among the most challenging words in all of scripture for wealthy Christians and the wealthy North American church. Um, this is a verse that I use when I hear people talk about the authority of Scripture and they have a pet project or topic that they want to say, Mark, well, the Bible's the Bible, so we have to listen to the Bible. And I say, okay, you want to listen to the Bible? Then let's listen to the Bible. And I bring up this Scripture here and I say, you know, John the Baptist says if you have two coats, you must give one away. If you have more food than you need, you must give one away. The Bible's the Bible. Are you going to do that? How many coats do you have, by the way? Well, I have the spring coat, and I have the fall coat, and I have the winter coat, and I have the sports jacket, and I have this jacket, and that jacket. I said, well, you're going to give them away? This is a hard, hard part, a real challenge to us, or many of us, not all of us, but many of us, because we have significantly more than we need. Yes, we give to the salvation angel tree. Yes, we give quarterly to the food banks. But are those significant contributions for where we're at? We all get checks from our employer, from the government, from our retirement accounts to pay our bills. And that money that we get every month has different people's names on it, does it not? A certain amount goes to the mortgage. Certain amount goes to the electric. Certain amount goes to the phone and the internet. Could it be that as people of faith, God for the leftovers, to some degree, 
Though that money has somebody's name on it too, Mr. Jane Smith, Mrs. Jane Smith, that God wants us to share with other people. What do you think? There's also one more, and that's these soldiers. And I have no direct correlation between soldiers and what's going on now. So I don't want to say anything more other than to say that what's being said here in this part of Luke is this. That, that what God has done for us in Jesus applies all across our whole lives. Everywhere. To impact and shape it and color it. And are we going to let that truth do that? as well as the things we like to do and want to do. I'm starting to get Christmas cards. Are you starting to get Christmas cards? Mm -hmm. No, not yet, Josie. Oh, they're coming. Oh. Did anybody get their John the Baptist Christmas card yet? Anybody? You got it today. John the Baptist is wishing us a Merry Christmas but saying, do not deceive ourselves. If you really want to receive Christmas and the Christ of Christmas, then it's about taking inventory of where we're missing the mark in little ways and big ways and changing our lives or trying to. You and I, we, we, that's why we all need saviors, right? Nobody cleans themselves up enough to stand in the presence of God. We're disciples of Christ by the grace of God who comes to us in Jesus and he loves us and he claims us. But he calls us to do the best that we can. And that depends a lot upon our own decisions and choices. We're in the season of Advent. And Advent for the culture that we live in says it's about remembering and celebrating the birth of Jesus. Getting ready for that to celebrate it and have parties. Uh, uh, Hollywood has, has co-opted the gospel message and in some ways done some movies that are good, but often their Christmas specials are, are nothing to do with Christ at all. The business community has also co-opted Christmas story for their bottom line and their profit. But here in the church, we're different. We're different not only because we're going to celebrate starting after this service to remember and celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, but these first two Sundays, we have focused not on that coming of Christ, that advent of Christ, but the advent of Christ coming as an adult, coming at the end of our lives, at the end of our time, our here through the Spirit now, calling us to be better, to be the kind of church and people we can be. It's not an easy message, but it's a life-giving message. And you know, I found in my life that sometimes I can get away with it being sugar-coated to me, but sometimes I need the plain, unvarnished gospel truth. How about you? This message is as much for me as it is anybody else. Amen.
this time I invite those who are able to please rise for our affirmation of faith. We are called to be the church, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has you to join me in a spirit of prayer. Let us pray. Glorious God, we approach you this day with song in our hearts and praise on our lips. You have chosen to dwell in our midst and bring us salvation, often in spite of ourselves, and we give you thanks and praise for that. As a warrior in battle, you attack the forces of oppression. Make us as determined to see that justice prevails. Where there is hunger, help us to do more than ally it. Give us the insight and conviction to attack its causes. Helps us to provide shelter for those who are homeless. Forbid that our warmth should lull us into neglecting their ministry. ministry. Make us advocates for the voiceless, a tower of strength for the powerless. Let those see in us a force for justice and peace as we compact whatever gives your people and keeps them in chains. Separate the weed from the chaff in our lives. Help us to focus on the good we can do and be to your glory. When in response to our baptism we ask, what shall we do? Make us receptive to the guidance of your Holy Spirit. The storehouse of our faith is cluttered with well-meaning intentions. Many of the past year's resolutions lie forgotten. Remove the gap between our words and our actions as we seek consistency in faith and living. We have offered our prayer. Now we commit our time and our efforts to be the people you call us to be and in Christ that we can become. On this day, we lift up for your care and concern. Rodney, Debbie, David, Cassidy and Bill, Richard and Ruth. Your blessings and power be with Matt and Judy, Lori, Martha and Larry, Chuck and Mary, friends of George Fry and their family's family, Mary Ann Cope and Debbie. And now I invite you either out loud or silently to share who or what's on your heart this day in the spirit of prayer. Dear God, even though we often wander from the path and sometimes very far and misunderstand what you call us to be, we give thanks that you eternally love us and claim us and call us back and invite us to a better place on the road of life. Help us to hear it and move together onto that road so we can be your people as individuals and the church. We pray this prayer in the name of Christ, who taught us to pray to you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We will now continue our morning offerings, our morning worship, with our morning offerings.
answer to all prayers, help us to live as we pray. Through these gifts and our rededication to your purpose, may our lives be answered to the prayers to those seeking some sign of your presence in this world. Make us a blessing that through our acts of love, generosity, courage, and service, your spirit blesses the world. Amen.